so we gave this session at Java One, and when I gave it, uh, it was myself, Mark Heckler, who is my colleague at Oracle, and then a guy named Sean Phillips, who is a um, he's an orbital sciences kind of guy, and um, so they couldn't be here, but. I've, uh, I've got a, recorded a little video from each of them to, to give them a cameo appearance here because they prepared this session as much as I did. So if there's any spare seats, please, um, please raise your hand so that people coming in maybe kind of scoot in, scoot in and let the people coming in sit down and be comfortable, please. Okay? All right. Um, so my name is James Weaver. I am a technology ambassador, Java technology ambassador with Oracle. And uh, I really love JFall. I love coming here. I love um, uh, just visiting Holland with my lovely wife, uh, Julie, if you'll stand up. Um, Julie Weaver. There you go. We've been married 38 years. And uh, so she travels all over the world with me as we do conferences. And we just love to come here. It's, it's, it's so neat. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, drone development, uh, talk about how we uh, are achieving autonomous flight with a, we we'll talk about um, the Raspberry Pi, you've heard of the Raspberry Pi. Um, and so we put a Raspberry Pi and made it the drains, the brains of the drone. And then we're going to tell you a little bit about the, the quadcopter. Um, and then tell you how this ties things and uh, some of the tools. And then we'll bring into the mix some 3D flight simulation using Java FX 3D, and then talk about what, some of the next steps that we're going to do to make it more autonomous. So uh, first of all, we had to choose a drone, and then we had to find uh, a foundational library, a library that would sit on top of the drone and then be able to control the drone in Java. And then we decided, and then we had to figure out how autonomous do we want to make this thing. So um, there's a couple seats over here, by the way, if you'd like to come in. Uh, a couple seats up front here. Actually, three, four. Okay. So, um, so what we needed was a drone, a brain, and some power. And so this is where it kind of gets interesting. First of all, which drone? And what were the criteria for choosing a drone? Well, we wanted it to have a published API. We wanted to have a community around it. And we wanted the equipment to be relatively inexpensive. And um, so we decided on the Parrot AR 2.0. There's a, there's a picture of it there. And then in choosing a library, we wanted to choose one that was, was capable, reliable, robust. And so we decided on the Parrots on Java uh, library. And so it is a Java library that has an API that then communicates directly with the onboard, uh, through the Wi-Fi uh, onboard computer on the drone. Message from Mark Heckler. Hi, I'm Mark Heckler. I'm a software engineer at Oracle Corporation. And I've been working with Jim Weaver and Sean Phillips to bring some intelligence to drones. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Wow, they're seated awfully close to the front. Um, have you all signed waivers? Did you sign your waiver when you walked in? Okay. Well, that's great then. Let's uh, let's let's carry on. Okay. Uh, anyway, we wanted to provide some intelligence or add some intelligence to drones. What we settled on as a platform is the Parrot AR Drone 2.0, and that is a really nice, uh, well-rounded drone, very capable, that you typically control with a cell phone or a tablet. And the way that typically works is you control all of the, the logic, the control on uh, your device, and you connect to the AR drone via an onboard wireless access point that the drone has. So just like your router at home, you're connecting to it as a client. Once we chose the platform, we needed to choose the brain behind the operation, and that's where the Raspberry Pi comes in. The Raspberry Pi is a very inexpensive, very capable computer that, uh, and very small and light, uh, with low power consumption requirements, that allows you to load Linux on it and um, make several modifications and do several things that would be very difficult to do on another platform. So we loaded Raspbian, hard float, and JDK 8 for ARM, 
and then we set about to make the hardware work. And the first thing you'll probably notice is that we have two Wi-Fi plugs here. Uh, what that allows us to do is tie one to an interface which acts as a client to the drone just like your cell phone or your tablet would and then to run a uh, host APD and a, uh, a, an access point on the Pi so that we can connect to it from our laptop and control, uh, take control if need be, but also to push software to the drone or to the brain and to debug it and profile it live and on board, which is extremely nice and, and very, uh, very efficient. Now that gets the brain on the, the drone, but there's no way to power the, drain, the brain from the drone. So what we had to do at that point was figure out a way to provide power to the brain. And that is where this comes in. This is your standard uh, USB charger for cell phones, for mobile phones. And this, this one in particular provides 2600 milliamp hours, so it's got a good uh, time range and it uh, puts out one amp of current, which if you're using uh, Wi-Fi plugs that don't draw a lot of current, as these Edimaxes don't, uh, then you can run your Pi and the two plugs and everything you need off of this. So what we do to make the magic happen is uh, we use Velcro and we stick these two together and then all I've done here is take a USB, a short USB cable and plug it in to the Pi and to the power source and then we turn it on. And as you can see that boots the brain. So at that point to make the whole thing come together all we really have to do is connect the brain to the drone. And now we have the makings of an intelligent drone. So at this point, the drone uh, has a lot more capabilities than your standard... Oh, 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 my goodness. Well, I hate it when they become self-aware. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, back to you, Jim. I uh, hope you all have a great, uh, great session. And again, to those of you in the front, good luck. So, so I uh, take your warm uh, congratulations and, and appreciation back to Mark, please. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll convey that to him. Okay, so as Mark said, some of the pieces are the, are the drone itself, the, the brain is the Raspberry Pi, a couple of uh, Edamax Wi-Fi adapters, uh, an SD card, uh, the power was that, um, that lipstick charger that he talked about, and then just a cable, and uh, then he used some Velcro. So, so the, the, the brain, the, the Raspberry Pi is the, is the, the central um, piece there. And that's, uh, now in his configuration, he strapped it onto the, the drone. Um, I, I like the flight characteristics better when you don't have that, that heavy um, Raspberry Pi and lipstick charger on it. Plus the AR drone wasn't designed for it anyway. And so the brain, uh, we're using the same software that he did, but instead of running it on a Pi on the drone, it's, we're, run it, we're going to run it on this computer, but it's going through the same Wi-Fi, you know, the, it's uh, communicating with the Wi-Fi on the, um, uh, on the, the drone, um, sending commands and things, working with the API. So everything's the same, except it just isn't, you know, writing on it, uh, making it heavy. And so there's the lipstick charger for the power source. There's a bill of materials for, um, for how you could build one of these. And there is an appendix in the last slide. You could download the slide from, from JFall. And uh, you'll see an appendix if you want to build one yourself. And then um, there's some, some uh, details on kind of getting it to work. It's a, a bit, uh, as Mark says, a bit fiddly, trying to get the Raspberry Pi and the software and the two the Wi-Fi adapters and all that, you have to go in and deal with the software stack and use IF, um, IF plug D and things like that and tune things. So um, anyway, uh, we can get you the full documentation upon request. So it really, you know, we didn't anticipate many issues, 
But as, uh, as another uh, uh, couple of colleagues can attest that I'd like to introduce now, uh, if you'll please stand up, Timon and Eva Venstra with AgroSense here in, uh, here in Netherlands. Um, actually, they'll be featured in the uh, community keynote today. So please, please be sure I'll be uh, leading the community keynote. They'll be, fe they'll be one of the uh, people featured. So uh, please come to that. So, uh, as they can attest, um, working with drones, uh, working with the IR drone, um, there's, a, there's some challenges there, right? So, we didn't anticipate many issues, but in hindsight, that was just silly. There were firmware challenges, API challenges, equipment challenges, and that kind of thing. So, we were expecting everything was going to be great, like uh, Rosie the Robot, for example, in, in the Jetsons or, or R2-D2. Um, what we ended up with was uh, was bad robot that cuts you, and uh, Mark has Mark and me. You know, Mark uh, has torn up his uh, his drapes and things and cut himself. I've I've got several scars. So um, yeah, so it's really bad robot and cuts you with a little bit of uh, jaws thrown. It's a little thing that uh, that Mark created that uh, stresses how bad it is, and and also. You can see how bad it flies with the heavy Raspberry Pi and lipstick charger on it. Very wobbly and on. I'm always afraid it's gonna go, go down the stick. You'll notice there was a uh, filament on there, and the uh, drone wouldn't fly away and, and kill some. So the anatomy of a quadcopter: there are uh, there are four spinning spinning blades of doom here. Um, there are brushless motors. There's four motor controllers. There's a lithium polymer battery in here. Uh, draws a uh, thousand milliamps. There's an onboard wireless access point on the drone, and that's communicated to by the API, the computer, over Wi-Fi. Um, and there's an indoor shell, and then there's an outdoor shell that's not quite as protective. There's an inertial measurement unit. It's an IMU. It's got nine degrees of freedom, uh, accelerometers, X, Y, Z, um, uh, gyroscope, uh, roll, okay. Roll, pitch, yaw, right? Okay, three degrees of freedom. And then a magnetometer on three axes so that it can sense uh, what direction it's going. There's also an ultrasound height sensor uh, on the bottom. And uh, so it's good for, I, I forget, is it up to maybe a couple meters, I think? Um, it's ultrasound, so it can sense its height up to a couple of meters. Above that, then it uses a pressure sensor and, and so the pressure sensor then tells uh, how high it is. There's a front camera here, and that's just for you know you're taking uh, taking video while it's flying. There's a, a, a bottom-facing camera as well. That's for taking video while flying, but it also is for visual odometry. So it can it's got some software in the firmware. It's got some things baked in to where it's looking at the the surface of the floor. And then it can tell, it tries to, to tell how fast it's flying in uh, X, X or Y directions. So the, the flying print, it's got a quadcopter. It's a quadcopter, of course. And if it wants to, um, it wants to go, uh, go on the yaw axis, then it just be crazy. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, Um, on two of the rotors. It will accelerate the torque on two of the rotors, the opposing rotors, and that way there's more torque uh, in one direction, and that way it will turn on the yaw axis. For, for uh, pitch, then it, uh, it introduces more uh, velocity on one 
of the rotors and less on the other, on the opposing one. And then same thing with roll. So what we're going to do is go ahead and fly the drone. And uh, this is the code then that, uh, that we wrote. There you go. My lovely assistant, my wife Julie, will, uh, uh, will demonstrate here. Um, so this is the code that, uh, that uses the API that we wrote uh, for an autonomous flight that then in turn, under the covers, uses the, uh, the Parrot on Java uh, code. So what this is going to do is it's going to take off and hold for five, milli or five seconds. It's going to go right at 20% of speed for a second. And then it's going to hold and go back as to change this. Yeah. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, okay. test, testing. Yeah, there's this mic as I shake it. So then this is uh, one where it controls the LEDs. There's some LEDs on board that you can control. Oh, very good. There's some LEDs that you can control. So, um, uh, so that's play LED animation, and that's in the software that we created that then uses the underlying uh, framework that Parrots on Java created. And so this is a, a video of that happening where we first blink uh, one color and then we blink another color.
So, um, so now uh, I'd like to kind of segue into IoT concepts. Um, one of the big pushes that we have at Oracle is uh, leveraging IoT, leveraging Java with Internet of Things. And so as uh, we have uh, Java ME and, and Java SE embedded, and as we have more things out there, Java is, is really well suited for the Internet of Things because it's got things that are needed baked into it already, like security and um, you know garbage collection, things like that, that, uh, that are very helpful so that engineers don't have to reinvent the wheel every time that they want to uh, code a new device. So um, some of the concepts and tools that we're highlighting then in this presentation would be NetBeans. We're using NetBeans. We're using Raspberry Pi with Java on it. Also, we're using uh, MQTT. There's a Java FX version of, M of, uh, of an MQTT display um, that Jens Dieters in, uh, in, in Germany created, and I'll, sh be, I'll show you that. MQTT is a messaging protocol for uh, the Internet of Things so that you can publish and subscribe to messages and then send and receive them in different nodes of, of the Internet of Things. And then there's Mosquito, which is a, an implementation for um, MQTT, which, which uh, helps you with publishing and subscribing. So this is a diagram of what's going on here in what I'll show you now. And that is, uh, we've got the drone, we've got uh, the computer, as you know, um, away from the drone, but it could, could very well be on board there. Um, we've got Mosquito running on the, um, on the computer, and then it's going to publish the flight data. So in the API that we created, not only is it using the underlying um, layers, it's also publishing to MQTT the flight characteristics or the flight, um, the things that it's collecting from the drone like roll pitch yaw angles and uh, battery, um, battery uh, voltage left, uh, percent left, things like that. And so you'll see that in a second. And then that's the MQTT FX client that Jens Dieters created. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start this up here. Um, Julie, if you'll reposition here. We'll be able to see it live. So this is the MQTT server. I'm going to subscribe to all of the nav data. First of all, I'll connect to it. Mosquito, by the way, is just running here in this um, in this window. So it's just a command line thing where we we started it up. So now we're uh, subscribing to all the A4J navigation data, everything is coming from the drone, then we are publishing to an MQTT uh, uh, service. Um, so we've subscribed to it then, I think. Uh, maybe I'll make sure. There we go. And now we'll go ahead and go to NetBeans, and we'll fly the thing again, crossing our fingers that, uh, that no one gets hurt again here. But then we'll be able to see MQTT here and watch it uh, collect the data. So we can see things like speed, roll, pitch, things like that as it's in flight. So it's a, it's a demonstration then of, uh, of the Internet of Things. Bad robot. There we go. Okay. So anyway. So now, um, now we'll go ahead and, and segue to the 3D aspect. So um, it turns out that the battery life in the drone isn't that, isn't that good. You know, it, it runs for maybe 15 minutes. Then you have to charge it and keep switching them. And to really be efficient, you need about three or four batteries to be able to, to, to switch. Plus, there's, there's um, you know, the logistics of flying and things like this. So we asked uh, Sean Phillips, the other co-presenter to create a 3D simulator and so I'd like to, for him to go ahead and explain um, that. Uh, I do want to tell you he's a, he's a bit off the wall. You know what off the wall means? Uh, he's kind of nutty um, so I'll just uh, warn you there. 
He wouldn't mind I if I told you that. My name is Sean Phillips, and I work for a company named AI Solutions. We provide access to space for both NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and other space agencies around the world. We're located just outside Washington, D.C. I was invited by Mark Heckler and Jim Weaver to help them with their Java One session this year titled Welcoming Our Robotic Overlords. Their bright idea was to take a bunch of four quadcopter drones and attach Raspberry Pis to them and then give them all the smarts that they need to go flying around the audiences without chopping people's heads off. And so far, nothing bad has happened. So in the meantime, they said, well, we're having a lot of trouble. It's a lot of work to try to test the code and try to get these drones to move around. It'd be really nice if we had a 3D simulation that could help us test some of this stuff. So instead of Mark Heckler flying his drone around in his living room, in his house, and breaking his lamps, he could instead fly it around on the screen and just break pixels. So they asked me for some help. So I decided to use JavaFX 3D. So I used a few libraries to do that, and Jim Weaver is going to demonstrate some of the software I made that live and uh, show you some slides to go with it. I won't steal his thunder, but I would like to mention a few technical items. First, I use a great model loading library called, from Interactive Mesh. Uh, it loads 3DS, Collada, OBJ, etc. For this project, I have several OBJ assets in with the source project, uh, a, a TIE fighter and an x wing fighter. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, for the 3D cube world that you see, I had that from uh, FXYZ, which is a third party open source JavaFX 3D component library providing anything from 3D scatter plots to sky boxes to all kinds of uh, shapes and billboards. And finally, it should be noted that the method for navigation I used is a simple form of dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is essentially taking the estimation, the, taking the commands and the data that you receive from your, your real life system, i.e. the drone, and performing estimations and, and tracking that, those estimations. Now there's a problem with that, of course, and that is that if the estimations, in this case in the 3D world, don't match the actual world uh, uh, movements of the drone, there, there gets to be a cumulative error. That is an error that's adding up over time that you, as a dead reckoning system, can't determine. So that's one of the weaknesses of the current, this current code, is it's dead reckoning around in the 3D world. So if you look to extend this uh, example that we're providing with this presentation, please keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, we designed this code to be very flexible. Uh, the code was written in such a way that new commands could be built, defined, uh, parsed whatever, with whatever rules that you would like to have. Uh, and so you'll see that it's very easy. Uh, I used NetBeans 8 to do that. Uh, yeah, there it is, and uh, you'll see uh, that there are three really major classes you need to address. Uh, the autonomous for three uh, autonomous four J three D is sets up the three D scene. Uh, Add some mouse and keyboard handlers here, and uh, accepts commands via drag and drop as Jim is going to show, and then recognizes those commands and then issues uh, commands to the drone. That's handled in the Overlord class. The Overlord defines your drone, and this is where you tell it to say, okay, if you receive this command, this is what you need to do on the screen. And you'll see that I've, used, I've relied very heavily on transitions and translations, as you would expect in a 3D scene, but I also rely heavily on timelines and properties. And the reason for this is I couldn't use standard paths because the standard path in JavaFX is only 2D. It does not support 3D translations. So we kind of had to hand tool it a little bit. Finally, if you want to change how your drone moves or if you have a different type of drone, you're going to need to play around with the formulas that perform the dead reckoning itself. And that is here, the sensitivity variable, and also the power uh, and to a certain extent your duration calculations. All right, well, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the demonstration, and back to you, Jim. Okay, again, I'll, I'll carry back any uh, thanks that you give uh, to Sean. Okay. So, um, so this is the 3D scene, 
And um, uh, what we do is we will we'll drag the .afr file that, that our software, the, the brain software, creates. So as it's flying, it's sending to a file um, the, the movements. And then we're going to drag that into the software that Sean wrote, and then it will show those movements. Now, in a future iteration, what we want to do is do that live so that as the drone is flying, it's showing um, what the movements are. Uh, but, but uh, you know, one step at a time here. So first of all, I need to find the, the library. I didn't set that up before the presentation. So I'm going to find the library, really, or the, the, the file that we're, going to, that we're going to put in here. So here's the flight data. This was the last flight. And then we will start the software. That's the Autonomous uh, for j 3 d software. And we're going to hope that the software works uh, well with this monitor as far as showing it on the display on this very small monitor. Yes, it does. That's good. Always a good thing when demos work. And so um, I'm going to show it actually from your perspective. So you watched it fly from about this perspective. So we're going to drag that file into the scene. Get, everything, get rid of everything else here. Okay. And so now it will, um, it will track then all of the movements using the TIE Fighter uh, uh, object that, that got brought in. So there it's, it's hovering, of course, then flying across the stage this way, hovering. and then landing okay using using Sean software so the next step that we want to do is you know we've we've given it some level of autonomy right we're not having to control it with a controller or a you know a, an iPhone or anything it's the smarts are actually on board in the computer uh, we're giving it commands and it's it's doing those commands but um, it doesn't know where it is, right? It, it knows where it thinks it is, but it doesn't really know where it is. So we want to, in the next step, we're going to give it some more advanced autonomy. So to do that, um, we need to use something that is a capability that actually comes with the drone, the ability to, to spot visual tags. So here we've got um, this, uh, this roundel. It's a, it's a big zero and one on a piece of paper. And, um, and it's called an oriented roundel. So when the drone's flying, it uses its bottom facing camera, and if it spots it, then it reports A, that it spotted it, and B, uh, using the downward facing camera, what pixels that it sees um, that tag in, you know, the, the rectangle that it sees the tag in, and its orientation, and its height. So then it can tell, you can make calculations then based upon that, where the drone is in, in XYZ space and, and uh, yaw, um, where it is in relationship to that roundel. Um, then, as you can see, I guess I'll blow the slide up here for you. As you can see here, Um, we're going to implement a control loop where we have, um, at any given time, there is a place that you want the drone to be. You know, you want it to navigate to some position. Maybe I want it over there at, at, at um, you know, 3,000 3, centimeters uh, on the x-axis, you know, 200 on the y-axis, maybe 2 meters above, and I want the yaw angle to be uh, at 45 degrees. So I want it at a particular place but it's not at that particular place and because of the oriented roundel it knows that so that's the desired pose so we take the measured error because we know where it is and then we take the difference or 
take the, the difference of where it is and where we want it to be, that's the measured error. And then we feed that into a controller. So there's several types of controllers you can implement. One of the most common is called a PID controller. So it takes the, the distance, the, you know, the error, and does the P stands for proportional. It does some type of proportional calculation, some proportional gain to make it uh, make up the difference between where it's at and where it needs to be. There's the I and the D stand for integra integrative, integrative, and then derivative. And so integrative um, takes the past movements, derivative then forecasts future mo movements, plugs all that into a formula, and then decides what kind of control do I need to, to give the drone in terms of um, acceleration on the different axes to make it um, overcome those, you know, to, to make it correct itself to where it'll end up where it needs to be. And that's an iterative thing because once we apply that control to the drone and then we sense its position, we have some other error, either more or less error. And so it's an iterative process until it arrives to where we've asked it to be. So that's the thing that we're going to implement next, this control loop. And so it turns out there's a lot of, uh, lot of math, uh, linear algebra, probabilistic theory, some uh, matrix uh, operations, things like that. So um, uh, it's, it's not a real easy thing to do, but it's, it's certainly uh, uh, fun. So I wanted to, to thank you for attending on behalf of these guys. And if you have any questions, yes. Well, okay, so the question is, why can't we create a vector between where the robot is and fly there, right? And so um, in, in, in the current thing that we have, the current drone that we have, uh, we don't, we're not implementing the, the tag, right? We're not, we're not Im implementing any kind of visual navigation, so it doesn't know where it is. It knows where it thinks it is, right, because of, of uh, odometry, you know, because of... Uh, um, because we've asked it to go so many meters on the X, Y, Z axes, right? So it knows where it, it's supposed to be. And if we can assume it's there, if it can assume it's there, then we can tell it the vector, which we do. But as you notice, it didn't always land, you know, where it was, where it took off. And if, so to go to that step that you're talking about, if it can know where it is, then it can compute an accurate vector and still probably not land there, right? Because there, there's always noise in the system, but at least it'll know that it didn't get there and it can iteratively get there. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, okay. Okay. That is correct. That is, it has to do with the measured error between where it really is in space and where it wants to go. Other questions? Yes, question right there. Yes. Please speak up. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear. First, about collision detection. Yes. Um, what are the possibilities? Is it hardware related to uh, what it involves? Okay, so the first is about collision detection. Um, and so there are many, um, and you know, I feel like I should bring Timon and Eva up here to maybe be thinking about um, some, some other things regarding answers, because I know that you've probably dealt with that as well. But for collision detection, there's lots of different techniques, right? Um, so there's, there's this idea where um, there's the state of the world, right? The, the universe, where um, maybe uh, if the state of the world was this room, uh, the things that are in this world could be monitored like that speaker or people, you know, these things. Um, and so if... So there's one idea for collision detection where you try to model as much of the relevant information is in the world, and so then um, and then the the the, uh, the drone or whatever robot can be cognizant and try to avoid things, right? Um, and it can also that could also be augmented by um, you know the onboard cameras to make sure you know just in case it's not where it's supposed to be. Um, so you could degrade that all the way down to just relying on onboard cameras 
and flying through things, avoiding things that might even be moving where you don't even know what's in the world. So that's all I know about that subject, really, unless you guys have any other... The drone has no way of, of knowing uh, when it's going to collide or not. So the only way you can do it is with the camera. And that's, that's pretty hard to do because, especially if you fly into a wall like this, which is uh, monochrome, so it only has one color, you don't know what your position uh, relative to the wall is. So you're probably going to fly into it before you can calculate that you're too close. But on, the, on this drone there is no uh, way. I know that, that uh, more expensive drones, they have a, a sonar type of uh, hardware built in uh, and they can actually sense that the object is getting closer. But Thank you, Timo. Um, your second question, let's save that until some other people have asked questions. Yes, sir. Great, great. Yes, I, I should say that. Are, are you one of the people that are giving the presentation? Okay, very good. So there'll be a keynote right after the community keynote in which um, these guys, tell me your company again. Yes, one of the sponsors. Um, and um, they're doing a keynote and I, and I saw the rehearsal and it's, it's freaking awesome actually. And then also they'll be doing a deep dive in this room about um, showing you more stuff. It makes, I'm glad that uh, ours was first and yours was second, because I would hate to follow yours. So, okay, anybody else, any other questions? Yes. Right. Okay. So why did we choose the AR drone? Um, it was uh, it was cheap and available, and and uh, you know kind of did what we need. Um, I we are going to uh, take a look before we do these next iterations. Actually, I think we've got it on this slide here um, at the bottom bullet. May require a change of platform. We're going to take a look at other platforms, um, regard because you know as they have more capabilities, why reinvent the wheel, right? Also, the AR drone, the, while it is an open SDK or an open system, it's, I've got two minutes, thank you. <laughs> so, um, um, it's open, but um, it's, it's not supported real, real well. So, we do, do have issues there. Uh, regarding GPS, outdoor flight, right? Uh, right, so, not indoors. Okay, well, uh, I guess we have... They're, right. They're, okay. So there's GPS for this drone as well, Timon says. Um, but again, it's only good outdoors. Okay. Uh, two more questions, including your second question. So your question, please. I'm sorry? Can it fly on its own? Yeah, it pretty much flies now. Could you give a demonstration? Yeah, it flies automatically. Well, we just did, right? No, you can hold it, but you can control it by hold it. I'm not sure. Maybe come up, uh, uh, come up after words. Actually, meet, meet me outside. Not, not, not like that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss your question outside. <laughs> okay, your second question. <laughs> your second question, yes. Could you use mobile networks instead of Wi Fi? I'm going to allow my colleagues to address that uh, final question. Well, there is a, a guy who uh, changed the drone and used the, the normal uh, uh, controller they use for the uh, mobile flights, for the, the, the planes. 
I know it's like ultra ultra high frequency uh, controllers, and they have very high uh, range. So so it is possible to use this drone and do a little bit of soldering and put the receiver on, and then you can use other networks as well. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your attentiveness. And uh, I do want to, again, thank my guests, Timon and Eva um, uh, Venstra, and uh, as well as Mark and Sean, as well as uh, my colleagues here that are going to have uh, the keynote and um, another session in this room. Um, also, do stop by the Oracle booth and uh, get a free uh, power charger. So um, I'm supposed to tell you that as well. Thank you very much.